Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? If you can hear me okay, can you just quickly chat, put a message in the chat to say that everything is okay? Perfect. Thank you, Preeta. First of all, welcome everybody. It's great to be here. And it's a very significant evening for myself as a very proud Irishman that we are celebrating this gathering on our national holiday of St. Patrick's Day. So we look forward to, to spending the next hour or so with you to discuss a topic that is not just incredibly important to my little island, but I'm sure you're, where you're from in terms of Mauritius. And before we begin, what we, what we want to do this evening is just to give you a bit of background in terms of, of where the project has come from, where we're going. And just to give you a sense of, this is the first of three webinars. And you know, with anything in life, when you begin something new, you have teething problems. So bear with us if there's any technological issues or anything like that, but I'm sure we'll get there together and, and we can flesh through where we're going in terms of the recommendations, but also some of your reflections. And indeed the title of the session this evening is, is very much symbolic of what we're trying to achieve, not just through the research project, but over the next couple of webinars. And we see it very much as a dialogue with, with the diaspora and with the community. So colleagues will go through some house rules and due, due course, but very simply, you know, feel free to use the chat. Please engage with each other and, and with the panelists. And most importantly, also, if you have any questions to, to answer, please let just, just use the, the Q&A function. And using those two functionalities will help you with interact and engage with, with, with the sessions, hopefully. So we're also being streamed live on Facebook. So if you are speaking or engaging with questions, please just remain cognizant of the fact that that, that will be streamed live. And, and as they say in Ireland, just mind our P's and Q's to make sure that, that we respect everybody on the call. So, so at that point, you know, I'd love to hand over to our colleagues at IOM if, if they're online and have access to, to the speaking platform, to just to share some welcoming remarks on the project, just to let you know where the project has come from, what has been driving the research, and most importantly, where we're going with it, which we'll address in the, in the recommendations. So I'll hand over to Tanya for now, I believe. I also see Celine, who, who may like to say a few words. So Tanya, I'll hand to you. Great, uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, welcome everyone. So just before I go over the background of the research and the project, uh, I would like to invite so our head of office who's on the call today, uh, Ms. Céline Lemel, to say a few words and welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much uh, for joining us from wherever you are or all over the world. So. I guess it's the beauty of technology now. We are able to interact uh, virtually and uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for us. So I won't be very long. I just wanted to say thank you to the ones who have already participated in the survey and to you also for uh, contributing to uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, so um, we will have a presentation of the key findings of, uh, of this survey and uh, we really want to hear more from you, from your ideas and what you think about the findings and how we could uh, really focus our uh, energy for uh, the next steps, because uh, this is just the beginning and we really want to engage more with the Mauritian diaspora. Uh, it's a great potential. A lot is done already and uh, we are here really to support this initiative. So um, without being uh, too long, I will hand over back to uh, Tanya to say a few words uh, about the project uh, that has been conducted and uh, so that you have a, a better understanding of the overall framework. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you, Celine. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, just before we jump into the main part of the event, which is much interesting about like the recommendations. I would just like to quickly give you a quick overview of, uh, of a project. So as some of you are already aware, uh, I can see some of you were already part of a, of a consultation. So from October to December 2020 last year. Uh, so we, IOM, conducted a series of consultations in the three uh, pilot countries, which were Canada, Australia, and the UK with the overall objectives to strengthen the relations between the diaspora, you, 
and Mauritius. So now we have finalized the results of these consultations and uh, we are pleased to hold this uh, series, uh, this diaspora series and welcome you members of the diaspora from, for, the first, uh, very, for the very first session to present the recommendations of these consultations and hear from you, as Martin mentioned, what will be considered as priority to you and so we can better support this program and initiatives uh, for diaspora engagement. Uh, I also join Celine in sincerely thanking the members of the advisory group. Some of you are on the call today in these three pilot countries for all their efforts, for all your efforts, your contribution, despite the pandemic, which made this project a success, as well as all the diaspora who participated in the interviews and completed the surveys. I wish also to extend my thanks to Dr. Martin Russell and Ms. Emi Rajati, who are on the call today, who most of you, I think, already know. So the IOM researchers who have conducted the, recomm the, the research and have also worked on the recommendations. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for, for uh, your support on that. And thank you for Martin for being here today on St. Patrick's uh, Day. I will just quickly go over the agenda. So uh, Martin and Emira will just go over the recommendations and then uh, we wish to hear from you. So we'll have a Q&A section, a Q&A uh, board of uh, the session. So your feedbacks are most welcome. Then uh, we will conclude and uh, just before we start, so I'll just go over a couple of house rules. So your mic should be automat automatically muted while your uh, speaker is presenting, but just in case uh, this doesn't occur, please ensure that your mic is muted when someone is speaking and feel free to make comments in the chat box. Uh, as Martin said, please uh, stay respectful to all participants and attendees in your comments. You can also ask questions in the QA section and uh, we'll try to answer all the questions, but just in case, uh, one, we will also do one-to-one -one sessions afterwards with the researchers. So Emira will provide the link in the chat box as well. Uh, please note that the webinar will be uh, live streams on Facebook. Do, so please bear this in mind and I would just like to thank you for your cooperation and I will give the floor to Emira and Marcy. Thank you. I fell into the trap of being muted, which I think is, you know, one of the, the sayings, sadly, of the last 12 months is that you're on mute. Please unmute, you know. So, look, first of all, just to echo what, what, what Tanya and Celine have said and, and to place our thanks on record for the IOM team as well. We'll speak about that more in a moment, but even the commitment tonight and the thinking of the three different time zones and sessions that we're having tonight and over the weekend is to try to reach out to as many diverse geographies as we can within the diaspora but I'm conscious that it's I think it's 11 10 p.m for Tanya and Celine and the team and Tanvi so, so thank you for being here so late in the evening so so, so let's let's get to it and and before I begin a, a, a deep dive in the sense of the recommendations and some of our, our, of our reflections from the research you know I just love to get pause for a moment to allow my colleague, uh, Ms. Amira Jetty, to, to quickly introduce herself because we'll see a lot of her in the chat. You'll, you'll hear a lot from her later on in terms of facilitating conversations. So Amira, maybe you just want to give a quick background and, and an overview of how we collaborated on the project, if that's helpful. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, in this first webinar. As Martin was saying, it's kind of a pilot and we have two more lined up. Uh, it's great to see some of the uh, diaspora members that we have actually spoken to with Martin uh, and the development of the report and the recommendations um, and your suggestions have been very helpful throughout the time. Uh, we have uh, worked together uh, with my colleague Martin on that report and we'll continue collaborating in the field. Um, and um, it's always a pleasure to talk to all of you and uh, a special thanks go to members of the advisory board as well. Um, I won't take too much of the time. I think it's best we go straight ahead to uh, the presentation and then basically we can talk through the questions and answers that you may have as we go. Thank you all. Perfect. Thank you, Mira. And just, just to reaffirm, whether you're, you're part of the webinar platform on Zoom or you're, you're looking at through, this, through Facebook, please engage. We, we, we want to hear your comments. We want to hear your, 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 your hopefully positive comments. You know, if you have some concerns, that's okay too. We, we, we can talk through that and just let you know that you can comment and engage either through the platform, 
directly in terms of being on the webinar, but also through the Facebook page. And I think there was a question from Sheev or Direction just to share the, the, the link for the, for the Facebook stream. So if we could share that in the chat as well, it would be very helpful. So Amir, if we can just begin to share the screen, please, and we can begin to go through the, the main event in many ways, in the sense of Perfect. the recommendations we'll that. And, and where we go from here. Sounds but good. as I said, Tanya gave us a bit of background in terms of, of where the project has come from, where it is and where it's going. And before we go into to, to the real detail of the presentations, I'm also acutely aware that I have a very strong Irish accent. So if you don't understand, understand anything that I say, just please ask, ask me to clarify or just give, give a little nudge in the chat box and we're more than happy to, to clarify. But what we want to do this evening is, is in many ways to give the first view of some of the preliminary findings of the research. And I think it's only due, due care and due purpose that having the diaspora give up so much of their time, uh, either through the advisory groups that we talk about more in a moment, but also people that took time out of their days to sit down and, and do the surveys and to help the project in different areas. I think it's only fair that we have these sessions to sit with the diaspora and say, well, these are some of our reflections, but also these are some of the recommendations that we think the diaspora have identified internally as a community that colleagues in Mauritius have also helped us to identify and, and look at that wider question of how do we actually build this framework up and how do we build that interaction in, in, a, in a more coherent and, and systematic way, if you will. So if you just move to the next slide, just to give you a sense of, of where this is going and you know why now for diaspora engagement. And the beauty of it is, and I think it was, it's, it's a sign of why the research was incredibly timely and important, is that there's a very significant global movement happening in terms of engaging with diaspora communities. And the, the front page of the Economist article that you mentioned is that, 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 that you see is actually about a decade ago, I believe. And what's been really interesting over the last decade or so is that there's been an explosion of interest from not just governments, but civil society actors, the private sector, charity and philanthropic foundations to, to really look at one of these amazing growth areas in many ways. If you think about, obviously the last 12 months has been a little bit of a, a barrier to this, but preceding that you, you just have this increased mobility of people moving around the world. And, and what's really interesting for, I'm sure an organization such as IOM, but for your own story as, as a diaspora is that, you know, the number of international migrants in the world is, is just growing phenomenally. And the beauty of it in terms of diaspora engagement is that when we talk about diasporas, it's, it's a bit of a broader concept than, than just migrants or, or migration. So we're actually talking about, you know, maybe second generation, third generation. So as you begin to shape that, there's something very powerful in it. And I think this, this article from The Economist, as I say, when, when this was on the front page of The Economist, that's when the, the world really began to take notice. So that's part of the reason of, of why we're looking at this now, not just for Mauritius, but globally. And research and data tells us, for example, that there's over 100 countries in the world that are trying to develop some form of, or have developed some form of institutional framework to engage with their people abroad. So I just wanted to give you that scene setter to, to let you know that there's something much bigger happening here. And I think it's, it's a, a perfect time through this research and some of the recommendations to make sure Mauritius is part of that conversation and indeed, hopefully in time, leading it. And as I say, I come from a very small island, which is a dot on a global map. We're an island off an island. But what we realize, for example, is that we have a global family that are willing to, to step up and help when the time is right. So if we move to the next slide, please, Amira. What we begin to look at and, and what, why we begin to look at this for many different reasons. And as I say, your, your entry point can vary. So whether you're a member of the diaspora, whether you're working for a government or an organization, whether that be for profit or, or nonprofit, what, what's begun to emerge in the sector is an understanding that there's a, there's a concept of diaspora capital. And if you look at the quote here in terms of definition, it refers to the resources available to, to a country, region, city, location or organization and is made up of people, networks, finance, ideas, attitudes, and concerns for their place of origin, ancestry, or affinity. So what, what we're basically saying here, and, and this is to give you a sense of, of, of some how the research was actually shaped and, and how we came to, came to be in terms of the recommendations, what, what we're realizing is that you have this diverse talent and diverse opportunity in a sense of what can actually be harnessed from diaspora engagement, or most importantly, network from diaspora engagement. So one of the questions that we had very early on for ourselves was, you know, what are we actually looking at in terms of Mauritian 
diaspora capital and trying to figure that out. And if we move to the next slide, we will give you a sense of what we're actually trying to look at in terms of the research. And I don't want to move too quickly or too slowly. It's, it's always difficult to gauge on, on an online platform and a webinar for, forum. So please just keep engaging with, with questions and comments and we're happy to clarify. But setting the scene for the research, there was a couple of categories of, que of questions that we, we had to kind of look at. And the first three questions that we have in this, this slide are essentially the, the baseline questions that you have to ask in terms of diaspora engagement. And that is, who are your diaspora? How do you define them? And, and that's incredibly important when you think about the type of activities that you want to engage with your diaspora. Who are you actually talking about? The second is, where are your diaspora? And for this project, the, because it was a pilot research project, we looked at three, we looked at three key countries. We looked at Australia, Canada, and a region in the United Kingdom. So that question of who are they, where are they, and then most importantly, what are they doing? And to give you a sense of some of the, the feedback, and we, we can be all very open and honest and frank, and, and this is not a reflection just on Mauritius, it's the same in many, many different countries. Sometimes to generate that data, it can be quite difficult for governments and diasporas to come together to share that type of data. So the question is then who become the knowledge partners, who become the research partners to begin to unlock those type of questions and those type of answers. And that's where we, we came from in terms of this research, trying to figure out who are the diaspora, where are they and what are they doing? Then we had some design questions and it was something that a, a colleague of, of, of ours in the diaspora in the UK said to us quite clearly very early on. And he said, the question should be how can Mauritius support the diaspora? And that will lead to the second question of how the diaspora can support Mauritius. But it's a really interesting way of thinking about it in terms of that mutuality or that mutually beneficial relationship. So, so that was the spirit of the research in the sense of, of having that duality of purpose and, and benefit. A very simple question. And I think what, what really excited us about the research was that that was very much a listening exercise. So what we wanted to, to look at was what are the aims, concerns, needs, and hopes of the Mauritian diaspora? And let's, let, let's be clear, what we're hoping through this research is that this is the beginning of that listening exercise. And you'll see from the recommendations that there's much more that needs to maybe happen in the future to, to really develop that. And finally, what are the interests of the diaspora for their future relationship with, with Mauritius? Once you generate that type of data and you try to, you, you never get a full picture, but you get a good enough picture in many ways, then you have to begin to think of how, well, how do we actually make this work? And, and how do we do it in a way that serves not just Mauritius, but also the diaspora and everybody that, that needs to be involved in terms of the, the institutional framework. So then we began to ask the type of questions of what policies, programs, or projects can we shape in the short and midterm to link back to what we found out in the design questions. Ask very simple but very important questions of, well, what is the role and responsibility of each stakeholder in that work, including the diaspora, and thinking through that piece. And most importantly, how can we build a better culture of diaspora engagement in Mauritius? Because I think what was interesting for us, and, and hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here, Amira, in terms of, of speaking on behalf of both of us <laughs> as researchers, what was really fascinating to us was that there was an incredible strong desire from the Mauritian diaspora to get engaged and be actively engaged, or perhaps just more engaged in terms of beyond what they're doing now. So the question for us as researchers is what, what were those mechanisms? So let's move to the next slide and begin to get into some of that and to give you a sense of, of how we did the research. So to give you a quick snapshot of some methodological outputs, and I, I'm a boring academic at heart, so I can talk about methodologies all day, but I think I put everybody to sleep. The big, the big contextual setting of this study and this research was that it was developed in the context of the global pandemic. So it was very clear to us at the, at a very, at the very early stages of, of the, the research as Nothing was really set in stone in terms of international mobility, whether you could travel and, and, and things like that to meet with the community, that we needed really strong local ownership of the project in the, in the pilot countries that we were looking at. So we created three Mauritian diaspora survey advisory groups. They're, they'll all be listed in the report as promised. I think I see some people on the call tonight that, part, that were part of these groups. And, and to, be, to be brutally frank, the project would not have been possible without the work and leadership of these people. They, they gave up their time 
for free. They, they engage, they open their networks, they open their, their hearts to us in many ways. So we want to place a very strong thank you to everybody that was involved in that. They were incredible. So as what we began to do then was to also to begin to map out organizations, whether there are some very formal organizations in the Mauritian diaspora or particularly in the 21st century, there's a leaning towards more digital networks and online networks. So we began to do the desk research there. And as was mentioned, we also developed surveys and stakeholder interviews. So we began to talk to as many people as we could, again, in the context of not having the ability to go meet physically with, with the community. So as we move into the, the recommendations and, and what we're going to talk about for the next five, 10 minutes before we open up the floor for conversation, if we just move to the next slide, please, Amira. These are just some general reflections on the research that, that work at a top tier level before we actually get into the, the cold hard recommendations of the research. So one of the things that we found, particularly from the data that we generated in the surveys, but, but also from the extensive desk research and, and wider consultations with the community, is that the diaspora is very much gendered and generational. And mainstreaming gender and diaspora engagement is critically important, given the, the where values and the type of values that the diaspora spoke to us about what they want to see happen for the future of the country, but also the future of the diaspora. And that generational piece is, is it might sound very simple to note, but, it, but it's incredibly important to think about. And I think what we heard from the diaspora quite a bit was that, you know, some had a little bit of a nervousness about the next generation and subsequent generations connections with Mauritius and how do we harness and, and how do we shape more meaningful connectivity. And I think what's really interesting for us in the spirit of the research, we, we, we spoke quite a bit to understanding the relationship of the diaspora to Mauritius to, to a sense of Mauritianness. And I think when you think about that as a concept and when you begin to think about it across generations, what's really interesting is that how the next generations and younger members of your diaspora might represent or connect with their sense of Mauritianness may be fundamentally different to what would happen 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, particularly without the role of technology back in the day as prevalent as it is now. And I think that brings us to the second point in terms of we, what we found very simply and very bluntly was the diaspora was incredibly committed to Mauritius and incredibly connected once we sat down and spoke with them. And I think there were both here and there. And I think there was a couple of events that happened along the cycle of the project that kind of elevated that. And I think the third point that we want to speak to, and I think this is a very important thing to, to note, and the data backs this up, not just the data in the surveys, but the data from the desk research and particularly from census data and in, in, in the key countries that we looked at, there's incredibly strong capacity and propensity in the community to engage. The story of Mauritian diaspora living globally, or at least the countries that we identified and worked with, is one of overachievement and one of significant potential when you think about what can be built. So I think it's, a, it's about telling that story more at a very simple level and being much more clear and visible in the actual impact of the community. It's incredible when you look at the data. Let, let's, let's be frank and let, let's be honest, we, we heard some tough things as well in the research when, when you sit down and talk with diasporas, you will hear some tough things. Uh, and particularly when we talk about that relationship between diaspora and, and government. So as, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the research was also being conducted at the time of the tragic oil spill and there was some discontent and, and discord in many ways in, in, from the diaspora. But I think we have to front up to that reality and not let it be a, a fundamental barrier to engagement, but a, a space in which we can actually begin to, to use that energy and, and that heightened almost visibility of the community to think about how do we engage much more stru structurally. But this is just a commitment to, to everybody on the call that gave up their time and, and maybe told us some of these more, more sensitive issues and, and concerns that the research has not shied away from those issues. We, we've addressed them and, and we've spoken to them. And I think, as I mentioned earlier about a mutuality of purpose, what was really interesting to me, I, I think, is that at its core, the diaspora is, just cares about Mauritius. And that's shown true in a lot of the calls and data that we generated. And I think what's also interesting is that if we develop an ethics of care from Mauritius to the diaspora, on the other side of the relationship, something quite special could be built. So stick with us, we're getting to the recommendations. If we just keep going, there's one more slide before the recommendations, I believe. So the next slide, please, Amira. 
So in many ways, the, the research then had a couple of next steps to make, if you will, and a couple of very small steps on one level, but very important about thinking, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And as I mentioned, the question was, how do we build a culture or a system of diaspora engagement to successfully engage the diaspora, given what we, were for, what we found out and what we, what we learned? What we would recommend is that the government would have the role of a facilitator of diaspora engagement and create a conducive environment to, 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 to build that system that we spoke about. And I spoke about the ethics of care already, but these were the foundational principles that, that, that really shaped the work. And, and, and I wanna be clear with everybody, is that what, what we will see in the research report when, it, when it's made public for, for people to read in much more detail is that we go into these topics in, in much more detail and, and in terms of not just recommendations, but the key steps to achieve it. So everything around governance of diaspora engagement, right through to how do you actually further strengthen the community and how do you build those networks. But these were the founding principles or the, the foundational principles of, of where we would go with the recommendations. So here's the, ex the exciting part. If we move to the next slide. So the recommendations, when we talk about the system of diaspora engagement, we essentially see four strands of recommendations. And we see these strands almost as cyclic, where the challenge for the research or the opportunity ahead of us, more importantly, is, is, to, both, is to look both inward in terms of in Mauritius and to see what needs to happen, but also to look externally in terms of the diaspora, but also in terms of where the aims, the needs and the concerns and the hopes of the diaspora are. And how do we build that system out? So these are the four strands, institutional and leadership development. So that's looking inward, if you will, in terms of the, the institutional apparatus and, and building leadership in, in Mauritius to, to develop diaspora engagement. Strand two is on social and cultural capital. And we saw this as very much the glue of what the diaspora have been involved in. And, and most importantly, for a lot of the diaspora, we heard again and again of increased engagement with, with diplomats, for example, and embassies and consulates and wanting to build that system. So what we're going to look at in that strand is, is also the diplomas of diaspora engagement and how you build that through social and, and cultural capital, but particularly through public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. Strand three is looking at diaspora human capital program. And, and this is another way of thinking about what type of skills transfer or engagements can the diaspora get involved with for the development of Mauritius, because the data told us very clearly that this was one of the key areas of interest for the diaspora. And they saw it as a way, in, in, even just in terms of their more short to midterm engagement with Mauritius as a key area of interest for the community. And the final strand is looking at the economic capital program. So if we move to the next slide, and, and this will be maybe what, what people would like to consider or, or maybe to, to have a conversation about, these are the key recommended, rec recommended actions within each strand. So the reason why we built it this way is a sense of we see these three activities per strand as quite manageable types of initiatives and development programs. And what's also interesting for us is that they, they map back onto what the diaspora have told us in either through the interviews or through the data of the surveys and the desk research of existing initiatives or programs of, of where we think success can happen in terms of diaspora engagement. So if we go back to the perfect America. So looking in terms of institutional leadership development, we have recommended that, and this was in planning anyway, the creation of a diaspora cell. I think by establishing that it gives a policy and an institutional apparatus to, to really showcase the importance of diaspora engagement to the government. And, and most importantly, what's really challenging from a government perspective on diaspora engagement is that it cuts across so many different ministerial portfolios. And indeed, it also includes the private sector, and it also includes people like the media sector and education and, and different sectors, whether they're universities and so on. So the question is, how do you actually build that collaboration at an institutional level? So, so that's the first recommendation. The second is around the training program for, for the government of Mauritius. And I think what's really interesting for us is that this training process is, is something back to where we began in the presentation of, of what's actually happening globally uh, and how is this done well, and, but most importantly, how is that applied back into the local context of Mauritius and the Mauritian diaspora. And this is a big one for us in, in terms of the recommendations in strand one is the development of, an, of the first ever national diaspora strategy. 
And the reason why I, I want to maybe spend a moment on this is that coming back to the, the conversations that we've had with the diaspora, there are some issues that need to be addressed that will take some form of policy or strategy or legislative discussions. So for example, one of the topics that we heard about again and again was voting rights. And where we see this strategy playing a role is that it creates the space for the diaspora and the government to really iron out what needs to happen and where they have mutual interest. So I think that that just for people on the call that maybe have articulated to us some of the more sensitive issues or some of the more challenging issues that they see in terms of their relationship, please rest assured that these type of recommendations are, are tailored to those issues. The second around social and cultural capital and in many ways diplomatic capital, the, the first recommendation, and these are these are placeholder titles, let me be clear, we'd love to see the branding of these and the naming of these be locally owned and influenced locally. Is a, the first is a Mauritius means campaign. And what we mean by that is, is it's essentially a public and cultural diplomacy campaign so that the Mauritian diaspora can celebrate their cultural heritage so that they, they can converse more with diplomats, engage more with embassies and consulates, but do it in a way that really celebrates and elevates the awareness of the impact of the Mauritian diaspora where they are. And what we see that as leaning in towards and helping with as well is to help the development or further strengthening of Mauritian diaspora organizations or networks. What was fascinating to us in the research is we met incredible people, but not many people were talking to each other even across the three countries that we were working in. And, and this comes into the second recommendation in a sense of how do we actually build a Mauritian diaspora leadership network? And I think what's interesting with that type of recommendation is that you can also look at young leaders, you can also look at female leaders, and you can begin to build tailored networks that are really influential for the diaspora, but also representative of the diaspora. And the, the final recommendation in that strand is to bring people together hopefully when it's allowed post pandemic and hopefully in the not too distant future to create a diaspora summit. And this is again pointed to the spirit of, yes, there are, there are issues that need to be addressed, but they're not insurmountable, but we need to create a space where people can convene to discuss them. So, so that's the spirit of, of, of those recommendations. The, the third strand around human capital, they're, they're relatively self-explanatory, so I won't spend too much time, but there's been some incredible work done already in terms of building academic networks, for example. So we see a unique opportunity to create a fellowship program for the Mauritian diaspora. What, what we heard in the data, for example, was that many in the diaspora are maybe interested in going back for a shorter period of time. Maybe they're not in a position where they want to move back or can move back full time, but they're more than willing to engage in, in short term placements or fellowships. So, so that service services that need. Similarly, I think, I think the last 12 months has told us, <laughs> told us all or, or maybe taught us all that you know, embracing technology is going to be very important in terms of the type of work that can be done in this area. And the mentorship initiative in our mind is the development of an online mentoring program for the diaspora to engage particularly with emerging talent in Mauritius. And I just want to speak as well, I should have mentioned it maybe earlier that the Mauritius Means campaign, we do see the mechanism of the development of a platform there to, to really build the networking component of it. So hopefully you begin to see that these all begin to fit into each other. And the, the Mauritius Next Generation camp directly addresses that issue of the next generation and their sense of connectivity to Mauritius or their sense of belonging to Mauritius, but also their peer-to-peer -peer networking with their young counterparts in Mauritius as well. So we see that as, as something that has worked incredibly well elsewhere globally, and we can share examples of that, but it's something that I think a lot in the diaspora would love to see for their, for their children and, and for the, maybe their children in time as well coming through. And finally, in terms of the diaspora economic program or capital program, the first area we looked at quite obviously for Mauritius was around tourism. Uh, I say this as somebody that has spent most of their last 10 years living on the suitcases, traveling the world. I think a lot of diasporas are, are pretty kind of ready to, to pack the bags and get back home as soon as they can. So we see this as well as a type of initiative that can help the, help the diaspora maybe also engage or advocate with private sector. We heard quite a bit about the cost of travel to Mauritius, for example, particularly from colleagues in Australia. So this, this initiative is actually a way of working across the different sectors in Mauritius to maybe help with those issues, but, but to essentially run 
in, 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 an initiative that will be an open invitation for a certain period of time for the diaspora to come back and try to build incentives in and around that to help the diaspora. One of the things that the data told us also was that the, the investment journey for the, for the diaspora is probably more in the mid to long term than in the, the short to mid term. And what they're actually most active in at the moment, or perhaps even more most interested in at the moment, is engaging through charitable giving or philanthropic giving to social development and nonprofits in Mauritius. So the development of trust fund, and we want to be clear on this, we see the, the idea of a trust fund as something that would need very strong leadership from the diaspora side, in the sense of the management of the fund and how that gets played out. But the report develops that in much more detail. So we just wanted to be clear on that. And finally, you know, the, 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 the data does tell us that there are people in the diaspora that, that are investing and they do want to invest or they're interested in helping with the entrepreneurial ecosystem back in Mauritius. So the final recommendation is the, through the creation of a diaspora business competition where we see a couple of key elements to this. One is, is where entrepreneurs and change makers in, in Mauritius are open up to access up to people in the diaspora, whether that's for investment, whether it's for business connections. What we also see potentially, and this will have to be developed in more detail, is the potential to have a, a call of key challenges to be addressed in Mauritius, whether they're socioeconomic, social cultural, social entrepreneurial, that the diaspora can develop some solutions to begin to help back home. So, so that's it. I know I went a little bit over time, but I wanted to spend some time to really go through where we've, where we've come from. Hopefully it, it makes a bit more clear sense in terms of where we are, but just to close with a couple of thank yous, I think if we just move to the next slide, we just want to close by saying uh, just a huge thank you to all the advisory group members. As I said, some are on the call. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to get to know you, not just in terms of the, in a professional capacity, but for, for many of you in, in, in a very much personal capacity. And I think we've made a lot of Mauritian friends over the year, over the last couple of months. So we look forward to developing that. But genuinely, it would, could not have been done without you, particularly in, in the context of the global pandemic and not being able to, to get engaged. As I mentioned, we want to thank everybody that took the time to, to fill this out, you know, to share it with their friends, whether that's on Facebook or WhatsApp and everything that goes with that. But the final thanks from our end goes to everybody in Mauritius as well that was involved in it. You know, so not just government stakeholders and colleagues who, who helped along the way but especially to, to IOM, but especially to, to the young lady who opened up the call this evening, Tanya. Tanya has been up at 3 a.m., 5 a.m. <laughs> this evening, 20, 20 minutes to midnight. So we just want to place on record our thanks. So I'll pause here. I know that it's a lot. I know that, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to engage with everything in this type of format and presentations. So we are available for one-to-one -one calls. This won't be the last that you hear of us, but I'm gonna hand back to Amira now because I think she and colleagues have been keeping an eye just on comments and questions and also on Facebook. And we'll, we'll, we'll address some of those. So I think we've got some in, in advance as well that we can discuss. So I'll just hand back to Amira to, to facilitate that, but we'd just love to hear your immediate reactions and reflections on that and in terms of the recommendations and where you see the big opportunities and indeed some challenges, some, some challenges. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And Amira, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, for presenting the recommendations and the four strengths. Um, as you noted, uh, we are here definitely to provide more elaboration on uh, the recommendations as well as answer your questions and address your comments. For those of you that are uh, uh, listening uh, to us through Facebook, we're also keeping an eye on comments there. So basically feel free to send us um, any suggestions or questions you may have. Um, Right now, I will quickly check the, our Q&A box and questions there, uh, as well as uh, comments. Uh, let me see quickly, just one second. Yes, so let's go with the first question um, that we have. Martin, I'll... Um, I'll address this one to you. Uh, so the first question we got is, uh, how do the recommendations help the diaspora build their networks and organizations? Perfect, a great question. And I think the, the challenge that we have, uh, and this is 
you know, again, this is not unique to Mauritius, but it's something that came up in, 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 the, refer in, in, in the research quite strongly was that we, we have many different types of organizations and networks operating across the diaspora. And the difficulty we have for a lot of, of people who are incredibly courageous to, to step up and lead these organizations is that they also live very busy lives and these organizations are quite often run in their, in their spare time. So that big question of, you know, how do we actually strengthen those organizations? And I think if you look at the, particularly strand one and strand two, in terms of the recommendations, what, 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 what we'll be looking at there, particularly through the cultural and public diplomacy, is ways in which we can really understand the needs of those organizations and begin to support them in a much more targeted manner. Because if you want to think about it very, very simply, unless you have that really strong network of diaspora associations or organizations or leaders, you're almost missing out on your distribution channel in terms of trying to engage with your diaspora. So it's back to those questions of who are they, where are they, and what are they doing? So I think that's that's where we are. And I think what was interesting for us, Amira, feel free to, to, to share your perspectives because, you know, we kind of worked in different geographical areas. But what was interesting to me is that, you know, that shift towards technology as well. You know, so we have some really well-established organizations that do a lot of really fascinating work and have been around for quite some time. But what we're also seeing is, you know, for example, student networks at certain universities beginning to pop up. So we have that sense of really strong formal associations, but also informal associations beginning to happen. So what I would say is that within strand one and strand two, that's where we will see the support for the organizations. But I think the earliest part of that, coming back to the, to the diplomacy of this, is, is beginning the conversation between government and the diaspora to say, well, look, this is kind of what we think we need as a community and what we need as organizations to develop. And then you begin to build the Taylor program from that. Thanks, Martin. Um, we have quite a bit of questions coming in, so I'll just move forward <laughs> with the next one. Um, so Shiv uh, sent a question. Thank you, Shiv. Um, can we share the presentation slides publicly on social media? And uh, I'll answer that quickly. Just because we are live streaming the event on Facebook, we can definitely also share those slides. Um, I mean, they can be seen uh, throughout the live stream, but we can do that as soon as we uh, have the event uh, going now. Uh, another question coming in, uh, uh, Martin, this one is for you, is for Pre from Pritam. Uh, uh, he asks, were there any big surprises from your research and any similarities, differences across the different countries studied? Great question. I'll, I'll come to the surprises in a minute. Uh, but I think the, 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 the interesting pieces are probably the consistencies, right? Because that gives you a good understanding. And a couple of topics came up again and again, you know, and, and I think we, we tried to address them in the presentation as well. There are still some sensitive topics and, and issues that, that need to be addressed and the diaspora have some strong views on that. So one topic, for example, that came up across all regions was, was voting rights. Another was around greater advocacy. And I think, again, as I mentioned, the, the context of, of when the research happened in terms of not just the pandemic, but the, the oil spill as well in, in, in Mauritius. So, so that was quite prevalent, I think. You know, to speak bluntly as a researcher, that can either make you nervous or, or really get you to see the power of the community as well. And I think what, what was interesting, for example, around commonalities as well, is that in terms of needs or maybe things to provide or to engage with, we heard about the networking piece quite a bit in a sense of, well, how do we actually build networks across different geographies and how do we, how do we network with each other? I think in, in terms of, of surprises, I wouldn't say big surprises, but what was interesting to us was, again, the consistency around particularly human capital and skills transfer and, and engaging true knowledge to begin with. I, I think, you know, what, what was interesting to us from, from talking to the diaspora, and let, let's be clear, I think it, it's fair to say that the, the Mauritian community in Australia and the UK and, and Canada, they're at different stages of their own development. As, as communities, so because sometimes what you could think of happening is that, you know, diasporas that have, or diaspora communities that have been around for a little bit longer than others, they, they'd be more inclined in certain areas, whether that's for, for trade and investment, promotion, philanthropic purposes. So, so that sense of everybody kind of asking for the same thing in, in a very simple way, particularly around the short and midterm, I think was interesting to us. So again, the, my simple reflection on this was, you know, 
it, it's it's more about now committing to the long term vision of of actually building the frameworks and the systems to do this because I, I think and i speak openly and honestly and i've said this publicly on different platforms for different projects sometimes i work in countries where you just cannot see it happening <laughs> i cannot see it working for for whatever reason whether that be political whether it be historical whatever it is but in in this context i i think we have a diaspora that is more than willing and more than capable of, of standing up and helping and wanting to help a government that that is really beginning to invest in looking and and strategic thinking this through and the, the, the challenge and a lot of people on the call that we may have spoken to may have heard me say this over the last couple of months is well it's actually the middle ground that we need to build now and i think what we should be clear with everybody on the call is you know we, we shouldn't be thinking of these recommendations as you know a two-year three-year kind of play these are the building blocks of a much longer term vision and, and that brings with it a need for for some strong political leadership some strong diaspora leadership and going that way, but I would say to the diaspora on the call is, you know, to think of this as a long term perspective. And what we would love to see is that the recommendations that we've made become the first almost five year cycle of work that will lead into future recommendations that can develop out of these initiatives. So I, I may have gone off track a little bit, but I think, you know, those commonalities um, were, were something that shone true to us. And I think I wouldn't say big surprises, but what was interesting to us was the clarity of, of ask in terms of the diaspora, in terms of what they were really interested in. Uh, there's a follow up question to that um, from the same uh, attendee. Any thoughts on the timeliness of acting on the recommendations? So what can be done in the short term to keep the momentum going? No, it's, it's, it's a great question. And yeah. as, as I look at my, my, my gut reaction in terms of the recommendations that we've put forward and in terms of what we're hearing from the community is, is to think of it as it would, within that kind of four to five year cycle of work. And what, what you want in many ways is whilst the, the internal and institutional piece is being built, the activities externally are beginning to roll out as well because you need to keep that momentum. And I think what's, what's interesting for us and hopefully for people on the call that are living in the diaspora, there's a lot of the recommendations we when we talk about the role of government as a facilitator for example the, the hopefully colleagues on the call will see the opportunities for their organizations or their networks in, in certain areas and, and what we would love to see is the diaspora step up to really drive forward with some of these initiatives as well so whether that for example is the next generation camp or the mentorship program or so what, what we're trying to do is build the system internally but also to keep momentum as the question kind of asked very directly is what are the the, the low-hanging fruit if you will in terms of really engaging and i think cultural heritage is really important in that context mauritian culture is world worldwide known for, for its diversity and its richness so we can, we can really begin to tell that story in a much more creative way we can begin to bring the, the, the diaspora together through the leadership network at the summit so that momentum is building now, you, most importantly, with momentum, you have to you have to act on it. <laughs> you know, you can, you can have as many things on the list of paper as you want, but I think, you know, to really harness that or really hammer home the momentum, it will be about doing those initiatives early on, particularly around strand one and strand two. And again, as I said, please think of it as almost cyclic, in the sense of of, of the recommendations and where they're going. Um, from Facebook, we have a remark rather than a question. It's from Ashwin from UK. Um, she says the overseas Mauritian society in the UK is happy to link up work with other Mauritian organizations uh, within the UK and abroad to facilitate spread the diaspora messages. Um, so thank you for that. I think that's in line with what you were saying earlier, Martin, uh, with your point. Um, there's another question in our Q&A box. So just, yeah, please feel free to uh, send the questions uh, in the box in the Q&A, but also in the chat room if uh, that's easier. Uh, it says, have you guys been engaging with affluent Mauritian diaspora in your research? If yes, are they willing to contribute to Mauritius or creating a network? Yeah, so look, I, I think it's, we have to be careful of what you mean by affluent, you know, in a sense of, of setting the parameters for that. But the, the idea of the research was that it was open to everybody. And every, everybody in the diaspora that wanted to have a voice and share their voice, they could. Within the data, 
you know, we were able to obviously identify for some people if they were willing to share the, their data to that level in the sense of, you know, earnings and incomes and things like that. So you definitely had an element of the, the, the research addressing people that have been successful. But I think speaking back to the data that actually came from the, the desk research as well of the project, when, when you look at the, the, the impact level of Mauritian diaspora communities in the countries that we looked at in comparison, for example, to some other diaspora communities in those regions, it's one of, of, of great impact. And it, the tagline of this report is, is to talk about belonging, potential and impact and opportunities, you know, and it, the data backs that up. Now, in terms of are they willing to help, I, I think a lot already are and are very active in, in doing it. I think some, like most walks of life, I say this for the Irish diaspora as well, for example, you know, some like to have their name up in lights for doing that. Other people don't want anybody knowing <laughs> that, that, that they're doing it. So I think that's, that's happening across most diasporas. It's probably happening in terms of Mauritius. But the, the, the quick answer is yes, in the sense of, of, of wanting to engage. And I think, you know, what we heard quite a bit, for example, even in response to the humanitarian response to, to the oil spill, for example, was a lot of diaspora were saying, well, we wanted to engage, but the, the challenge for us was what's the mechanism that we can trust and, and what's the, the, the type of engagement that we can actually roll, roll in with support. So I think that's what we're trying to do in the recommendations is, is to provide some solutions to that. You know, and, and to be clear on that, you know, we would love to see a very active role for the, Mar for the Mauritian diaspora in helping to design those solutions. I think it has to be done together. So the quick answer is yes and yes, <laughs> but, but how you actually go about it, it will take a bit of time to, to really flesh through. Um, the next question, we have a few more, <laughs> so I'll try to keep an eye on all the questions, Martin. Sorry, I'm sending them all your way. Uh, it's from Alexander. Uh, it says, in the press, it has been reported that there are 188,300 Mauritians abroad. What is this figure and how was it estimated? Hmm. A more general question, what are the mandate and objectives of IOM and how does this survey help this? Perfect, perfect. Just in, in terms of the figure, that, that was based from a very recent research from the, the European Union Global Diaspora Facility, for example, and, and they've produced fact sheets on diaspora engagement for, for many different countries around, around the, the, the globe. So, so that figure would have come from the, the most recent research from, from, the, from those fact sheets. So that's available publicly. So I think if you just Google you know, the, the EU DIF and you'll be able to access it that way. I think it opens up a bigger question and I, I don't want to get into this because the academic in me could be here all night. <laughs> and, and, and the question is, you know, when you talk about Mauritians living abroad, you know, there could be Mauritian citizens, for example, but what, what's interesting in terms of diaspora and, and very subtle difference to, to just migrants, for example, you're also talking about different generations, maybe, you know, so going beyond. So what, what you're actually addressing there is a really important question of, of definition. And, and how do you define your diaspora? And we can go down many different <laughs> roads in that debate. I'm happy, but it's probably best we do it offline, one-to-one, -one, rather than bore everybody on the call from the academic perspective. But I'm more than happy to recommend some good books in it. So did the question, sorry, the second part about IOM's mandate, I think yes. we have people on the call that are much, much better equipped than I am to answer that. You know, So I don't know whether Celine or Tanya want to jump in on that now, or we can kind of go from there. Sure, I can quickly respond to that one. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the great questions. So uh, really in a nutshell, so IOM, we are an international uh, organization. We are uh, part of the UN system. And our mandate is really to promote uh, safe, regular and orderly migration and to basically support governments and migrant communities to harness uh, migration as a key driver of development. So in that sense, uh, diaspora are uh, migrants and the idea is really to support this community uh, in the development of their host country and also of their home country. Uh, it's kind of a win-win situation that we really want to harness. So basically, uh, you know, Mauritius is now a high-income country. There's a lot of development. There's a lot of potential. Um, you know, the Mauritians uh, people uh, are a great asset uh, because, as you know, you know, following the independence, a lot of people didn't believe in, you know, uh, in the in, in the future of Mauritius, and it's the people 
who have made it what Mauritius is right now. And for the future, uh, it's important to still uh, continue to invest in people. And that's what we want to also do to really support the government and also uh, the member of the diaspora to really fulfill uh, you know, uh, themselves and to you know, make those links and to facilitate uh, that. So that's really uh, what we are here for. So we have, uh, you know, we have been supporting the government in engage, further engaging with the diaspora. We have uh, piloted this, uh, this uh, survey and this whole project uh, with uh, the great uh, support from uh, Emira and Martin and from uh, the team here in Mauritius uh, led by Tanya. And uh, we will, of course, continue to engage. I've so I've seen a few uh, questions also related to the next steps and the future. So perhaps we can go back to that uh, towards the end, uh, because what is important is that this is just the beginning. For us, it was important to give a feedback on what we did in terms of the survey, but also to uh, look for the future and the next steps. So um, I hope I answered the question. If not, I will be happy to provide further uh, clarification. Thanks. And uh, back to you, uh, Martin. Perfect. Then I go back to Amira. <laughs> Thank you, Celine and Martin. Thank you both. Um, I will uh, read through a remark, uh, three remarks actually, coming from Shiv from Canada. Um, he says there are approximately 500,000 Mauritian diaspora and 35,000 in Canada and approximately 100,000 in um, Australia, um, which is probably the case with the uh, the numbers that we don't have statistically uh, on, on paper right now. Uh, there's another question coming in uh, from Pritam again. Uh, were there any insights around work home life choices for the diaspora and how this could influence future mobility choices for the diaspora and especially with current pandemic around the world? It, it, it's a great question. I, I think, look, it's, it's difficult without knowing in, in much detail when we talk about work life choices and, and options. I, I mean, what we did find in the data, for example, in the report goes through it is that there are certain sectors, for example, either in terms of where the diaspora are working and, and particularly where they may be more interested in giving back to Mauritius or engaging with Mauritius in terms of their focus in, in terms of, of, of that. I think what was interesting to us was, and I think it's more anecdotal than saying rooted in, in, in any hard evidence, because I do want to emphasize that this was very much a pilot research in the sense of, of the, the engagement with the community. What, I, what we did begin to notice was, for example, a, an evolution maybe in the type of, of careers and options of, of careers that people are considering. You know, we, we did see, for example, a rise in some entrepreneurial activity as, as the community developed and, and, and things like that. So I, I think that strikes at in terms of the capacity of the community and where it can get, can get involved or maybe want to get involved. So I think there's, there's facets of the story that everybody is very well familiar with. I think, you know, there's a very strong record of academic achievement as well, for example, within the diaspora and there's some incredibly talented academics, for example, in the diaspora. So I, I think I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be overly prescriptive in a sense of, you know, given where we are in the pandemic and it being so fluid, even as we sit here tonight or, or today, where, wherever you're based in terms of, of hosting the conversation about where we're going to be in six to 12 months and making any major projections on that. But, but as I say, what we do have a good sense of is different, the different sectors. We have a good understanding of the, the facets of that story of historical maybe migration and, and the type of careers that were developed. But we are beginning to see, you know, some much more visibility around, as I say, entrepreneurship and things like that. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but it's the best understanding that I could get of the question. So if not, I'm happy to have a one, one, one to one conversation on it and, and kind of help clarify that way if needs be. Thanks, Martin. There's a few more questions coming in. Um, and thank you for all the interaction, by the way, to all the attendees. Uh, this is a very, very helpful and very useful for us uh, in the next steps forward. Um, it's from Pamela. Uh, she says, I'm very happy to see the outcome of the hard work you all put in. I'm still skeptical as to how this report and its finding will really be assessed and by which government body. We have seen through time that diaspora has been engaging, but we could um, not be heard. How will that change now? And then she also says, happy St. Patrick's Day. I think that's directed to you, Martin. <laughs> so happy St. Patrick's Day today. 
No, perfect, perfect. And look, I, I think maybe, you know, maybe Tanya, I, I think we're kind of organically going towards the section of the kind of next steps. And I think yes. that, that Celine mentioned in the sense of, you know, where, where does it go from here? So look, the good news, and it's, it's in the public domain, is that the, the recommendations of the research were recently agreed for implementation by cabinet uh, in, in, in Mauritius. And uh, maybe Celine or Tanya wants to speak more to how these projects are developed and set up and run and their interaction with government colleagues and, and how we go through that process with them. So when we talk about the establishment of the diaspora cell, for example, we, we see that as very important to, to just give a significance at, at an institutional level, for example, for diaspora engagement. So, you know, the natural home for that will be within foreign affairs or the equivalent thereof in terms of foreign affairs and I'm basing it there. So that's where the, the consideration and the application will come. And I think where we are going next is, is to really develop a detailed action plan from these recommendations. And this is why we're keen to talk even more with, with the diaspora in many ways is, is to get, get a sense of, you know, what are the nuts and bolts now of really making these achievable? Because I'm conscious that, you know, this is the first time that many in the diaspora are seeing these recommendations, they're hearing about them. So rest assured that these will be developed in much more detail in terms of the action plan and, and putting in, in place those steps and mechanisms to make sure that everything that needs to be addressed, whether that's the role of the diaspora in designing these and getting involved in the leadership of it and the governance and the transparency and, and the communication system that, that go with this. So all the moving pieces will, will be put together in, in, in that way. Uh, so that's the best I have on that question. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough question, but I think we may be coming to that stage now where, you know, we talk about what's what's coming next, because I think that's essentially it, you know, but I'm, I'm not sure if Tanya or Celine would like to kind of step in from the perspective of working on a more day to day basis with the government as well. Uh, sure, I can say a few words, but uh, basically you've really uh, summit uh, everything, <laughs> summarize everything. So uh, in, indeed, it's uh, it's a project and it's an initiative also implemented in collaboration with the uh, with the government of Mauritius and uh, more specifically with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the idea is indeed to set up a diaspora cell. Um, so initially, this was supposed to be uh, done last year, but because of the COVID, it was uh, a bit delayed. But hopefully, it will be done perhaps later this year or uh, maybe sooner. Uh, but the engagement from the government is here. So we are making a lot of uh, progress and, uh, and the next step are really, really important now because what we really don't want is just to do the survey and then that nothing happens. So that's why we are now working on this action plan so that we can put the, those recommendations into actions. And that's also where we really need you. And uh, we, that's also the reason of uh, those three webinars and you know the different bilateral discussion that you can have with uh, both Emira and Martin so that you can also give us your views, your ideas, what you are for or against. Uh, as Martin said, there are like good things, less good things. We are open to everything uh, as long as it's something that is constructive and we can build upon so that we can uh, like build the future together. It's, uh, we know it's a, long, it's a long road, it's not a straight road, but we are committed to go along this road together uh, with you members of the diaspora and to support you and also with the government because it's really a partnership that is uh, being built now. So um, I think that's, all I can say for now. If you want more information, of course, we can also uh, perhaps provide more, but um, I hope that answers the, the, the question. Thanks. Thank you, Selena. That, that's very helpful. And, and I think just to, just to re-emphasize that, you know, please think of, of this webinar, hopefully colleagues that have been involved in the process to date from the diaspora will be able to confirm this. You know, we're very open and, and, and we want to talk to as many people as we can. So we've shared the link earlier in a sense of you know, if you want to have a one-to-one -one conversation with us, you know, please take up that option. You know, let us know. We'll we'll do it. You know, and there's, there's absolutely no problem. So we're more than happy to facilitate that. So th that's the spirit in which this research was developed, and we'd love to see that continue. Now that we're coming to the stage, as Celine said, of bringing things into action. Uh, on that note, Martin, just to add, so we've shared the same on Facebook. So for those attending, but for also those that could not attend or are just watching the live stream. 
feel free to uh, basically book a time for uh, to talk to us and just provide us with your suggestions, feedback, recommendations, or simply questions. We're more than happy to do that. Um, there's uh, two more questions I see, uh, uh, and we'll be checking Facebook in the meantime, just in case. I think this session is very lively and interactive, so that's very good. Um, the question is, uh, what are the insights about the diaspora and its relationship to the Mauritian citizenship? And it comes yeah. from Alexander again. Yeah, so look, I, I, this was one of the issues, for example, that, that came up across all different regions. And Amira, feel free to, to speak, because I'm conscious that people may be sick of hearing my voice <laughs> at this stage. You know, so I, I think what we're talking about earlier on, maybe some, um, some issues that come up in terms of legislative reform. And, and engaging on that, the, the issue around citizenship and, and some of the, the technicalities, for example, in and around that were, were something that many in the, in the diaspora came up with again and again. So I, I think it's, that's one of those issues, as I said, that I think needs to be, needs to be addressed at some point along the engagement journey, as, as Celine kind of articulated in terms of that, that, that walking along the journey together. You know, those issues of, and I think this is this, again, quite boring in many ways, this comes back to that issue of definition. You know, and I think what's what, what's interesting is that there are certain types of engagement, and this is again not unique to Mauritius, but generally in terms of diaspora engagement. You know, another issue we heard about was voting rights, for example. But if, if you take a very inclusive definition to, to your diaspora, that can make certain people back home very nervous about the idea of a huge voting kind of block coming in and making decisions. We have a very similar situation in Ireland. We have a referendum coming up and allowing the Irish diaspora to vote. You know, so there's certain types of engagement that you need a, a, a more narrow focus in the sense of your definition, but other initiatives where you want to be much more inclusive. So it, it's an issue that needs to be addressed, but that's where the action plan comes in again. It's about how do we layer that across and build it structurally across. But Amira, do you have any reflections on that in the sense of your calls or? No, I, I, I totally agree. I think um, it's probably the same same points that you're making right now. I'm conscious of time and I'm looking at all the questions that are coming in. Uh, so I think that uh, we have time for two more questions, uh, but I, I think we will probably uh, consider wrapping up soon. Uh, again, thanks for all the interaction. Uh, it's very useful and helpful uh, to hear all the comments and we are led by you as uh, Celine and Martin is saying. So uh, basically feel free to contact us even beyond these three webinars that we're holding. There is a comment from Pamela, I think on the answers provided uh, by you, Martin and Celine. Uh, she says, I think it would have been good that everyone who participated participated in that survey should have been aware that this was a collaborative research project between IOM and the government of Mauritius. I believe that, uh, Pamela, this was the case indeed. I think myself and Martin and, uh, and Tanya and Celine were even part of a few radio shows where we have made that uh, elaboration. And same goes to the invitations for surveys sent to the diaspora members and to the research interviews that we had. We've made sure to point that out. And we'll make sure to keep doing that in the future. I, I, think, I think as well, if it's, help, if it's helpful at this point, you know, I think as Celine was speaking, that that's more around the project collaboration as well. I mean, I do want to get across that this research was independent and, yes. and it was something that, that it needed to be independent, you know, because as we said, there are some sensitive issues. So, you know, everything that we've said in terms of, you know, the independence of the research ha has been adhered to, you know, so please don't have any concerns about that. It's of course trying to, the recommendations are trying to inform and help not just the government but and, and the diaspora, but the actual research itself and the the independent nature of it is is very much you know kind of as 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 was described in the project. I think Celine has her hand up, so she may want to make a point on that. Yes, indeed. No, thank you very much. I think it's a very important point to uh, emphasize on. Indeed, it's been uh, clearly mentioned uh, so that there is no surprise or anything. Uh, but it's important to know that, uh, yes, the overall project is uh, implemented in collaboration with the government, but the research uh, was meant to be independent because uh, we know that uh, some of the issues are sensitive. Uh, you know, one of the comments was about, you know, the approximative number of uh, uh, diaspora members. 
there's no data, there's no way to collect the data. It's something that is extremely complicated, not just in Mauritius, in like most countries. It's very difficult to have a, a diaspora register and give you know their information. And the point here is not to make a census of the diaspora and to uh, get you know personal information, but really to build this uh, relationship and uh, you know the confidence. So uh, having uh, this kind of research uh, conducted independently uh, by uh, IOM, well through IOM, but by independent researcher was uh, was a, a key key thing. Uh, so when we say that um, the research was anonymous. It is. I really stress that that uh, it's it is. Uh, we don't. We're not interested in like individuals' opinion, but rather, you know, in like the overall uh, result and the recommendations, so that we can move forward. And um, again, the collaboration with the government is key because uh, in moving forward, we need the government. When we are talking about, you know, setting up some schemes and facilities, it's very important to have uh, the government also contributing. And of course, we will also engage with the private sector to see how we can also further uh, strengthen the, the relationship and see how there can be this uh, kind of, uh, of partnership. So, yes, over. Thank Perfect. you, Celine. Uh, let's so uh, let's answer one more question and we should probably close it now and go to the closing remarks and the next steps and uh, thinking about the future. Um, it's from Krishan. Uh, it says, the thing is with the second confinement in Mauritius, it has been noted that Mauritians are reaching the diaspora for help. I would like your views on that. Uh, are Mauritian diaspora willing to help? I, I, I think without question, you know, and, and look, let me be, let me be clear. We, we, we saw it in maybe a different context just in the sense of, you know, as I mentioned, the oil spill, not to keep going on about it, but that was, you know, very much a humanitarian reaction. And I think that humanitarian reaction is happening again. And I think what we're seeing globally, not just in Mauritius, is that the, the pandemic, and this might sound really strange, but it, I think the pandemic has actually reawoken um, a, a lot of diaspora and, and their understanding and connection at home and wanting to engage. So I, I wouldn't, you know, be nervous about saying that I, I'm sure the majority of the Mauritian diaspora really want to help. It, it's about those those mechanisms to do it, you know. So whether that can be built as quickly as needs to be to help with the the most recent lockdown, which I think kind of happened a couple of began maybe three or four days ago, and uh, that is is a challenge. But I think you know what's interesting around that wider diaspora humanitarianism humanitarianism framework. Is that IOM, IOM colleagues in, in Washington, I believe, are actually developing something there as well. So it's, a, it's something that is happening, not just in Mauritius, but, but more, more broadly. And that's the spirit of the research as well, is to, is to make sure that Mauritius is, is really kind of driven and positioned within these wider discussions and debates that are happening as well. So again, I can't give you a specific example, but my goodness thing tells me the, the diaspora are more than willing to help. The data historically has told us in terms of giving charitably and get engaging philanthropically is, is one of the, the kind of the easiest and most reactive ways that diaspora engage. So I'd imagine that that could work in this area as well. Thanks, Martin. Uh, we've got a few more comments of praise. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, we're, we're trying to organize these webinars in the most transparent ways and um, get feedback from your end, but please, be critical as possible. Uh, we definitely welcome that. Um, I have just resend the link uh, for one-to-one -one interviews should you want to continue uh, talking to us and uh, address any points that you may have. Uh, please feel free to do that also on the Facebook page or through emails and please feel free to actually send the word out there of outreach for our two other webinars. One is happening on Saturday and another one on Sunday in case your uh, friends from diaspora of various countries or your own that could not participate in this webinar would like to attempt those. All the information uh, is already posted on our Facebook page, but um, we will also send out reminder emails to all of you. I think we can close the Q&A session, Martin. As uh, far as the last remarks, uh, I want to invite uh, Tanya, Celine, um, or yourself, Martin, uh, if there's anything that we would like to point out uh, as we close this webinar. No, look, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody on the call uh, for, for their time and interaction. These, these are tough gigs in a sense of doing it on, on platforms like this. So the fact that you have so many questions and comments tells us that there's uh, something very active to be to be challenged here. So I genuinely want to say thank you to everybody that, that has helped us. 
as, is, as you mentioned, uh, it's the first of three, so join us on Saturday and Sunday. And I want to say thank you to you, Amira, for, for facilitating. You're, you're much better than I am at these things, so it uh, wouldn't have been possible without you. So we'll, ha we'll hand to, to Tanya or Celine, whoever wants to jump in to send us off into the, into the evening. <laughs> Okay, I will do quickly you know, just to thank everyone uh, for their really interesting and engaging questions and all the insights. So uh, again, joining my voice to uh, Emira, please do not hesitate to uh, book, you know, one or one to one, uh, you know, sessions to further discuss. Uh, or if you prefer sending emails like the, the, the medium that you prefer will be ours, no problem, we will adapt. Uh, the most important for us is really to hear from you. Uh, I think that the motto of this survey was uh, cause nous tende. So it's, uh, it really, it's really what it is. <laughs> so really don't hesitate. Um, and uh, yes, over to Tanya for the final word. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Celine. I think you just mentioned what I wanted to say as well is like going, going back to the consultations, our motto or uh, tagline was like cause nous tende. So we want to hear from you and reflect your feedback in our work. So do not hesitate to reach out to us. And thanking you again for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Perfect. Shall we say good evening? <laughs> good evening to all. And evening, um, uh, have a good one. Have a good St. Patrick's Day for the sake of Martin. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Enjoy, Martin. Bye. Bye.